Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be going to the other side of tibia, that is medial condyle, isolated fractures. They are, again, very common fractures, but uh, the important point is that quite often they are high-energy trauma injuries, and their injuries are fairly common. There could be meniscal ligament injuries, and compartment syndrome also has to be looked into, besides because of uh, virus strain in these fractures. There could be peri peroneal nerve or popliteal vessel injuries also. More so, these injuries are more common when the fracture line is extending up to the lateral condyle of tibia. Then, just to have a few words of introduction, large medial condyle fragments may have medial collateral or crucial ligaments attached to it. And what happens as a result is that the lateral condyle has very little attachment or stability and tends to migrate proximally. And therefore, it is not a simple fracture. It may end up into a subluxation or dislocation of knee joint on the lateral side. So the fracture may look innocuous initially, but in due course, as the displacement increases, the subluxation or dislocation may occur. And that has to be kept in mind while planning the treatment. So uh, all these uh, fractures, you need to have a CT scan, as I emphasized earlier, also in lateral condylar fractures. And more importantly, look for the intercondylar fracture area. If the fracture line is extending into the lateral condyle of tibia, and there's an intercondylar fracture, probably cruciates are also compromised. And that has to be accounted for as well. And lateral view of the opposite, opposite side is also useful because the posterior slope of the tibial plateau may be varying. It may have a significant variation even the normal population, and that has to be accounted for, restored. And more importantly, when you're fixing these fractures, the posterior screws may be intra-articular while they may look deceptive in the uh, fluoroscopic control. Operative management. Non-operative is for very limited cases where there is no displacement. But again, these fractures need to be washed carefully because, as I mentioned earlier, especially those which are having extension of the lateral condyle, which may get worse. And initially, they may look very simple. But gradually, the dislocation of subluxation occurs. And the non-union is very difficult to treat in these fractures, as also is the malunion. Of course, in young and active individuals or in displaced fractures, you need to go for open reduction and fixation. Percutaneous screws alone are not very effective method of fixing these fragments. It can be rarely used in soft tissue compromise, but I think we have a better options of a percutaneous plate if the fracture is not comminuted. Or, as my colleague uh, in the previous speaker uh, who mentioned about Elizero method, I am not uh, using that, I am not very well conversant with that, but I think that can be a very good option uh, where the soft tissue compromises there, or, but uh, soft tissue en envelope is not good. Of course, buttress plates are very effective. You can have a anterior buttress plate which is put on the anteromedial surface, but if there is a coronal plane fracture, then you may have to go posteriorly and put a buttress plate posteromedially. I've already mentioned about uh, compromised soft tissues. Of course, locking plates will be a far better option if you're uh, having a, planning a percutaneous fixation of these fractures. Then incisions, three or four incisions have been described in literature, but more commonly anteromedial or posteromedial incisions are used for these fractures. Straight anterior incision is almost out. Of course, posterior incision can be rarely required, especially if there's a coronal plane fracture which is not accessible by posteromedial incision. Percutaneous fixation, I've already mentioned. Fresh fractures are good indication for that. Old fractures are not. Preferably in medially placed fracture line when it is not involved in the lateral articular surface. It protects soft tissue envelope. More laterally placed fracture line, if it is still not significantly displaced, may require additional exposure of the lateral joint line to ensure that the articular surface is stored there. Of course, it is not suitable for comminuted fractures. This is just an example of percutaneous fixation of a medial condylar fracture. Then you can also have a laterally placed plate, especially the new pre-contoured plates, they can have a stability in the medial fragment also. And you can put some percutaneous screws there and support it with plate on the lateral side, which can have a screw uh, going right up to the medial, uh, you can say, corner of the tibia. If there is subluxation, one should reduce it and then stabilize it, as has been shown in this case. 
in all these cases, CT scans are quite informative and useful in preoperative planning. Post-op rehabilitation, you can, rem uh, you can use a re uh, removable knee immobilizer. Day 1, 2, you can start with quadricep exercises and gentle knee motion exercises. After suture removal, you can do crutch walking, but no weight wearing till the fracture is sealed. Of course, if you have done some meniscal repair, then you should delay the mobilization of the joint for, for the period of approximately three weeks. Now, problem is of non-union or malunion these fractures, which is again fairly common, specifically if you have not managed them operatively initially and it gets subluxated later on in due course. And these fractures may be in non-union or malunion. In either situation, it is very difficult to bring it down first. And if it is malunited, it is very difficult to get a fracture and reduce it. So we have options, either reducing it if it is possible. If not possible, then we can fix it in C2 and do a corrective osteotomy for the virus comedy. These are some of the examples of that. In this case, it was a month old. There was some gluing, but we were able to mobilize the fragment and reduce it and stabilize it with a medial plate. Of course, the reduction had to be done by open method. It couldn't have been managed by Pugdenius method. This was a, now, this was a fracture which was, again, not possible to bring it down. So what we did was we fixed it in C2 and then uh, did a lateral closing with the above the fibular head to correct the alignment and uh, restore the axial alignment of the tibia. Other option was this was again a fracture. I, in fact, did recently only. I thought that probably I'll be able to mobilize it, but I failed to do that. Ultimately, what I did was fix it there and did a medial opening with osteotomy with bone grafting to stabilize the fracture and also to restore the alignment. So in the end, points to remember, I'll say, no method can be used routinely for all these fractures and each patient must be evaluated individually. Look out for associated neurovascular injury and knee dislocation and isolated medial condylar fracture, more so when the fracture line is going laterally or there is an instability due to ligament injuries. Soft tissue envelope is very important and warrants waiting if blisters or bruising is present, otherwise early surgery is the best option. Of course, if there is a compromise of the soft tissue, one can plan for ring fixator also. Extensive surgery on a severely comminuted Fracture may result in less than optimal internal fixation and need post-op immobilization, often resulting in the joint being neither stable nor freely movable. So you have to plan your fixation. If you are able to achieve that, then only one should opt for open reduction internal fixation. Otherwise, other options should be considered. If more than one incision is used, especially if the fracture line is going laterally, you should have a sufficient gap in between. Time. So the, uh, this is la last slide. Uh, you can go a little post medially for the medial side and you can go laterally for the lateral side. And of course, I must caution that any fracture, any screw which looks intraarticular on any of the views in the fluoroscopy is intraarticular. It should be presumed as intraarticular. It should be revised. Thank you very much.